Was it the Mikasuki? <laughs> was it the Seven? Huh? So hard to get I got Jesse coming in. Oh yeah, yeah. So I put together a nice presentation. Anytime we're good. Yeah. Yeah. The other classes I kind of do on my own, but this one I'm like bringing people in every, which is good for them. Yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 Yeah, you know, and then you take the time, but it's like, yeah, that's what you thought. You're here to help you. Right. Was, you went to the bus. I'll help you. Well, for me, you know, you know, you know, and it's like, it, no, we are, we were, 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 we But it's usually the same. It's usually the same. Usually the same. That's how much you can do. Right. Right. So if you forget, it's kind of just no. Yeah. You can get really excited. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you too. You stole my mentor. He's a mentee. No. Thank you. 
in that class. I mean, yeah. the next one's my only class left. I love coming in here. Yeah. Well, yeah. But your story is the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the way it flows and transition to each other. Yeah. 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 I'm heavily focused on leasing right now. Working with Lisa team, just trying to get Lisa to the project. Yeah, I'm glad I saw that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, they were gonna. I was gonna post all of the. Uh, yeah. That was the one our case study was in county. Yeah, yeah. We did well, our county cast every day. We had an app, or we had to go through their eight, uh, their ten k report. Yeah. On uh, on their whole, and we had to go back to the, the bankruptcy, what happened, and what added to oh, it. I'm glad I brought it in my hand. This was one of our last projects over there. It was complex. Yeah, it was really complex. They were high flying, doing everything they could. Yeah, Coral Springs and yeah. the project. It was interesting to go back through a bankruptcy and then see if we emerge now and what's happening. Yeah, most of their executive team was out of Rotary Bell and took over the Gables, and I've got four guys from them. Really? Yeah. What's the name of the department? Is it a partner? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we got to find a go there. I think I'll clear my boxes off. Yeah, I actually worked at a couple of them. Yeah, they got a bunch of them. They had a bunch of them. They were more on the West Coast of right? Yeah. No, 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 they were over on the Park Range. They had these really second homes and the massive plan development. Eagle Trace, Heron Bay. Yeah, you were for, I was here. One little key, one day of the moment. I was trying to see if you were going to be able to do it. I had a residential bank going on. I had a good few times on it. They were in the Chinese drywall.
the front end? No, I see they took the seat out. Oh, yeah, my bad, man. He did it, didn't he? Uh, no, uh, it's Alex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Alex. Alex. minutes off in the previous class and now we're starting five minutes late so it's 5 15 before we leave I, I need I need you facing the class oh not are you probably be in the front I do <laughs> I do, I do. No, no, it's not a problem with you it's not a problem with you being in the front it's not a problem with you being in the front it's it's where exactly what does that mean since when are you so sensitive, dude? Oh, so man. Come on, man. <laughs> Where's the rest of the class? Wait. You don't know. Let's go. I'm trying. You look on my chair. Dylan. Uno, uno momento. Uno, no. Uno, no. Uno, no. Can we? This is a fire hazard. This is a fire hazard. So, let's take this thing. Let's put it over there. Or Whatever. Okay, listen. Um, so we're waiting for a speaker to come, and while we're waiting for that speaker, I want to um, just go through a couple of things. First of all, where's Robert Saunders? There you are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We're missing three students from this class. So I, I you know, if, I guess if I don't remember you, you mustn't be here though. Where is Mariel? There you are. The choir is here, Pastor. Where is Dustin Anderson? There he is. Where is Juan Maroso Marquez or whatever? He did not answer the bell. Must have been a long night for him. Um, He's still trick or treating. Where is Daryl Ballou? I don't know. He should be here. He's in our group. Yeah. Where is Michael Cohn right there? Okay, so we're missing Juan. And we're missing Daryl. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change the order just a little bit and cover a couple of things. I don't have any news to bring you today. The only thing that I was, um, I don't know, taken aback this week. Uh, there's a recall of American Capital Realty Properties, ACRP. Anybody follow that at all? Dylan, you follow all the stocks. So tell me about that. No, no, no. I don't have my backpack on the ground. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, that's not a that's a pocket. No, that's not a pocket book. Right I put it on my bed, so I don't put it on the ground. Yeah. I know. I thought it was a person. She's a woman. I just don't. You don't be broke. Okay. Uh, uh, Dylan, did you read about this or no? I'm not Okay, so this is this is an extremely large, I forget the market cap on this, but it's several billion dollars. It's the largest read that's involved in uh, triple net properties. And they've actually gone through a couple of iterations of acquiring other businesses that were in this space. So there, there's like an asset management firm that sponsored some private REITs, they took one of them public, and then they, they sort of went on this whole buying spree and then they had a, some of the other private REITs that they had, they rolled into this thing, and so it's this behemoth. And again, I forget the number, but they, they own several thousand properties throughout the country. 
several thousand properties, four or five thousand, you know, triple net, you know, Walgreens and you know, CVS's and Burger Kings and Popeyes and Ford dealerships and anything that you can think of that are single tenant, triple net leased assets. And you know what they've you know taught with these. There's been three or four of these relatively big players. What they tout is we give you a very consistent. It's not the highest dividend. We give you a very consistent dividend. These are all credit tenants, uh, and and we don't have uh, any problems with that. So about come on up, Desi. About four or five days ago, uh, the the CFO and the CEO stepped down because there were accounting irregularities. And it was a small little blurb in the journal this morning, which I know you all read before coming to class because you didn't come here at eight o'clock. I was told. I was, I was told that we were we, we we made our guest speaker wait. Ooh, that's why we're going to stay till five thirty today. But what I saw the blurb I saw today was um, that the, the initial they, they hired um, I forget his name the former Arlen Specter was a senator from from Pennsylvania and they. Company immediately hired him. He's a, I should say, hired him. He's an outside director. And he's the director. He's the head of the audit committee. They've done a quick investigation, and they've identified that earnings were misstated in this company, and it was all tied to bonus payments that the key executives, you know, they needed to meet, meet certain objectives. They they manipulated earnings to get those objectives, mm -hmm. to earn their bonus pay, their incentive pay. And you know, eventually, when you steal from Peter to pay Paul, you know, eventually, somewhere down the line, you run out of places to pull money from. But for me, it was very disconcerting because a very high-profile REIT, one that really preyed on older, you know, the orphans and widows, right? Those are the people that buy into this type REIT, you know, guaranteeing a monthly dividend, monthly dividend, and you've got a total, you know, breach of um, the fiduciary responsibilities that, that the key executives have. So. You know, it's an evolving story. Hopefully, these guys wind up, you know, doing time and you know, teaching a lesson to everybody else. So, but try to follow that, Jesse. Can I add to that story? Please, please. You may have some greater insight. In I have four projects under uh, contract to be sold to this company in the next three weeks. Oh, and the lenders just pulled all their commitments. Wow. The market value dropped 30 percent. Now, because that, so that's a question. So I at one point had owned this stock because I I wanted a small. I'm not a, an orphan or a widow, you know, but I wanted I wanted monthly income, right? And but it just the stock kept going up. All I was like, wait a minute. I mean, it just didn't make any dividend yield. Got really skinny and all that. Um, but when this thing blew up, my first reaction was, hey, maybe I should buy it. I mean. But the reality is, at this point, you don't know what those financial statements mean. Yeah. And you need to let some time pass to figure out whether it was just a couple, you know, a little blur, a couple, you know, a couple of quarters, they just messed around, or whether some real, real big hole. And with all the acquisitions this company has done and mm -hmm. all the financial engineering. So um, typically in lender agreements, you have these carve out provisions that you may have firm commitments. But you know some of the you know carve outs are, you know if there's been fiduciary breach, on on the part of executives. So you know all of a sudden, look at Jesse's company now, all set to go, and now they can't close on a deal. Now Professor San Miguel's gonna have to buy these projects. I'm gonna have to buy these projects. So, so with that, let me turn the floor over. Uh, at, I don't know how many of you know Jesse Holzhauser. Jesse is a pillar of this program. Long before I knew about the program. Jesse was teaching the investments and finance classes in the program. He taught at NOVA for many years. He's on our advisory board. Um, he is a, I think the, 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 the foundation of the company works for the silver companies. I don't know what they would do um, without him. And he's been um, gracious enough to come and share a couple of hours of insight with you and the concept of diligence. But um, Jesse's a wealth of information. Tap into him interrupt him, ask him questions. Um, he's here for you. And for me, it's, it's going to be an honor and a privilege to sit alongside you. So, you know, Jesse, come on up. And the floor is yours. The computer is here. Oh, thanks for your remarks. I'm going to ask for a raise now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have um, Dr. Hanbury, you know, give us all raises. How's that? Yeah, there we go. Oh, 
Raise your tuition and then give no, 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 no. No, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Actually, go ahead. It's, it's so. No, no, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, 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 you're no, leaving. No. So she's she's forty three days out, out. So no, do that. Jess, it's over. It's over on this side. Like, they're both on. Cause you've got a. Good morning. It's all over. It's over here. There's like five of them. I would be grateful if you put this. away your electronics. I don't follow directions. Turn off your phone. I'm not looking at your. Turn off your phones. Put them away. Put your iPads away. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. As a figment of my gratitude, I offer you. Okay. Oh man, if I ate one of the, thank you very much, if I ate one of them, I'd be sleeping. I'd be sleeping. So. Rob, Rob, he's, he's not grading anything. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. and I can't yeah. Take it back. Oh, oh. <laughs> if Sam McGill wants one. Um, I'll take the whole box. Whoa. <laughs> Wait, what grade are we talking no, about? No, 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 Bear with me. I'm low tech. Can you, can you spell your last name, please? Uh, H O L S H O U S E R. Thank you, sir. Jesse, J E S S E. Jesse, if you don't mind, I can share your contact. Can I share your, Absolutely. Share your contact info with the class? You bet. You I'll bet. do so after uh, <clears throat> with a follow up for the session. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Does anybody need a break before we get going? Did you already break? They, they Ready to go. They've done enough breaks this morning. They've had enough breaks. One of the, uh, Professor San Miguel, thank you for your very kind remarks. And about half of it was true, but that's okay. Um, I think one of the hallmarks, how many of you are graduating in the next, after this semester? More competitors in the industry. That's great. Congratulations on making it to the program. Um, I think one of the hallmarks I hope you have found with the program is practitioners teaching you as opposed to 28-year-old newly minted PhDs in finance or whatever the case might be. So um, I, I hope you found that being exposed to these real practitioners and taking time out to, to, to spend time with you all. Uh, we can make more money cooking fries at McDonald's. It's not about money by any means. It's, it's, it's really a, uh, it's a matter of dedication and love for the industry and, and wanting to, to, to really educate the, the next generation of practitioners, if you will. Um, and that's really how we, with the foundation of the program was, let's get practitioners in the, in the classroom. We've had a war with the accrediting institutions. They don't like practitioners because all we know how to do is real estate, right? We don't know how to write academic papers. Um, but you, so I hope you find you fortunate that you're able to get the time that you did with the practitioners. The fact that you're able to spend as much time as you have with Professor Sam McGall is even a, a, should be a bigger treat. Um, this guy is, he probably hasn't bragged. It's amazing what, what he has accomplished in his life, and uh, not only do I do I um, respect what he's accomplished, but the way he's gone about doing it. He's he's one of the good guys. Okay, so uh, I hope I hope you all recognize that. Um, people, one of the things I learned as I started teaching was I uh, people have different learning styles. Some people learn one way, some people learn a different way. And it's difficult in the classroom when all of you have different learning styles to try to figure out how am I going to teach or lead with all those different learning styles. Let me tell you about mine. My learning style is I got to make the mistake. You can, you can teach me how to do stuff all day long and tell me and tell me and tell me until I go out there and do it and try it and make the mistake. 
that's 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 the best way for me to learn. Okay, so I know a lot because <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. And what I want to do today is share some of those mistakes with you. These are not just mine. There we uh, we were all flying this week, and collectively we had six people on the plane, and we spent two hours talking about war stories and what I'm going to share with you today. And, some of the things that we learned, uh, some of the experiences and some of the things that we learned. Um, due diligence is really, really hard. A lot of people don't make it hard, but it's hard. You, here's, here's the first problem. The world is against you. Your acquisition team wants to do the deal. Your development team wants to do the deal. The seller definitely wants to do the deal. The lender wants to do the deal, right? Everybody's lined up on one side of the table and they're all looking at you with daggers saying, tell me there's nothing wrong with this project. It's really, really hard. <clears throat> that's, that's number one thing that makes it hard. The second thing that makes it hard is people lie, people cheat, okay, people, may not tell you everything, which is not lying. You have to determine whether you think not telling you everything is lying or cheating or not, okay? Um, people forget things. You, you, gotta, you gotta be Sherlock Holmes. You gotta go out there and you, you gotta figure out what's going on. And it's very, very hard. Here's the good news though, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. When you find something wrong, People may not like it, but you're going to be a hero because they're all going to say, Whew, well, we didn't buy that $30 million apartment building. Good catch. But you're also going to find that you can use due diligence as an opportunity to, to, to identify ways to create even more value. And I'll talk about some experience we have with that as well. Um, so as I said, due diligence is something about research, 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 research. Two quotes I like, one from Einstein, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, it's the source of art and science. Okay, it's the unknown. Okay, and a guy, uh, Albert, sent, I'm not trying to, he discovered vitamin C and won a Nobel Prize. If Louis Pasteur were to come out of his grave because he heard the cure for cancer still hadn't been found, what would the National Institutes of Health say? Give me a plan, tell me what you're gonna, exactly what you're gonna be doing, and then I'll fund it, right? And he says, at that point, Pasteur says, I'm done, I'm going back to the grave. Because the whole point is, I don't know what I'm gonna find. I'm gonna go do research, okay? Who knows what I'm gonna find? I have a general idea of how I'm gonna go about conducting my research. It may take me this direction or that direction. So, Research, research, research. It's all about the unknown, finding out about the unknown. Now you've learned in your class so far, and we'll continue to learn, the typical steps in the due diligence process, right? I gotta check title. I gotta check my entitlements. I gotta check, I gotta check, I gotta check. All right? And, and those are all good. Um, do you do checklists in this class? I've got three different ones I'm gonna share with them. I'm walking through them without because I want them thinking through the process right, right now. Right. But I'm going to leave them with one of mine and, and two that I've gotten from two other guest speakers so that they've got multiple with it. <clears throat> Great. Okay. And, we, and we, we use the same thing. We've got our checklist. Lenders have their checklist. Buyers, sellers, everybody's got their checklist. Okay. And everybody's in a hurry for you to check the block. And the least that you can do to check that block, everybody's happy. Okay. Your job, even though you may not realize it at the time because of the pressure from everybody, is to refrain from checking that box so you're happy, you've completed all the research that you need to complete. So uh, here's, here's, here's my learning lesson. All of the stupid mistakes you've made in the past lead you into the person you are today. Never regret them. Now the key is being able to work in an organization where you can make mistakes and not get fired. <laughs> Back in the olden days when I grew up in, in, in this industry, I was real lucky that I was in environments that allowed me to do that. A lot tougher today. Today you make one mistake, you're out the door depending on the organization. 
I always tell students, my advice is uh, when you graduate, find somebody that will train, to pay you to learn, and that will allow you the freedom to make mistakes, not, not go waste five billion dollars, okay? If, if anybody crazy enough to pay you to learn, latch on to them. Doesn't matter how much, doesn't matter if you make 40,000 a year or 80,000 a year right now. They'll catch up in five or 10 years. And I was very, very fortunate in my career that I, I had that opportunity on a number of occasions. I got guys to mentor me, to take me, um, but I also tried to make it happen as much as I could. When I got out of grad school, I went to work for Pricewaterhouse's consulting division of real estate. And I was in New York, and I uh, introduced myself to every single partner in the office the first month I was there. Now, there's, we're talking about 150 people, okay? And I just introduced myself. I'd, I'd walk around the halls at 6.30 at night when a lot of people had gone home. And I'd find a partner with a light on. And I'd sit down and say, how can I get involved? What are you working on? So you gotta reach out. Don't just wait for that organization to put it in your lap. You gotta go after it. But that's, that's the first and last advice I'll give you today on career planning is find somebody that'll pay you to learn and allow you to make some mistakes, okay? Absolutely critical. At least it was critical to my whatever success I've had. All right. Let's go through some. Uh, now, some of these you're going to think I was an idiot. Some of these I'm going to think I was an idiot. Okay? I'll blame it to being young at the time. Again, not all these were mine, but some of them were. This one was mine. It's 1984 or 5. I'm CFO of a real estate syndication company in Washington, D.C. And we're syndicating government-assisted housing, suburban, elderly housing, subsidized by the government. There was no cash flow, but huge tax benefits. So we were telling, selling tax benefits. We thought we were in the real estate business, but we were really in the tax selling business. Now, we th thought correctly that this can't last. Congress is going to do something about this. And in fact, in 1986, they did. So we said, we've got to start thinking about diversifying into other areas. And one of them was, let's get involved in the apartment business. Baby boomers are going to want apartments, and we'll get into the whole thing. Now, I was from down here. So I said, that'd be fun to go to an apartment complex in South Florida. I don't like the snow and the sleet in uh, Washington, D.C. in January. It'll give me a, a reason to come down here. So I'm uh, working through my network. I find a guy that owns an apartment site and plantation. Okay. And we reach a deal very quickly. Pay X dollars, subject to uh, zoning. Along we go. We sign a contract. Everything's ready. I verify he signed it as the CEO of something something LLC. I verify that that LLC owns the property. <clears throat> this is great. Actually did a title search, went to the Secretary of State's uh, office and verified that it was an active organization corporation. All right, along we go. Put up a $75,000 deposit, I've spent about $50,000 on due diligence. I am down here one day see a friend in the airport, he said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on this deal on plantation, yada, yada, yada. He said, who's, who's the owner? And he, uh, I told him, and he said, he doesn't own that site. I said, what do you mean? The company owns it, and he's the CEO. He says, no, he's been trying to buy that site for about four years. He doesn't own it. Comes to turn out, the guy was hoping to take our deal Go negotiate a buy at a cheaper price and make money. He was not an officer of that corporation. Okay. Now, what could I have done that I didn't? Make sure he was somebody that could actually sign on for yeah, that exactly. company. You can go to the Secretary of State and not only ask if the company is active, but also ask, who are the officers? Give me the organizational documents that says, you are an officer. That say, so a lot of times the board of directors has to approve a sale. 
get the organizational documents, do the heavy lifting. Now on this plane trip I told you about this week with the six of us, I brought this up and every person in the plane, 20, 30, 40 years experience, not all of them said, you shouldn't bring that up, that never happens. And I told them my, my story. When I told him my story, the look on our head of acquisitions, the blood drained from his face because he said, I never verify that stuff. I mean, we'll find out before closing when the lawyers get involved. I just assume the guy knows what he's talking about. So yesterday, he spent the entire day on the phone calling up all of the people we have under contract. I need your organizational documents. I need, I need, I need, I need. Now, the chances of that are very low, but they're more than zero percent, as you can see, okay? Um, so those Je are Jesse, if I could just, just pipe in a couple yeah. of thoughts. Um, I had guests in from out of the country this week, and you know, young, young kids or children or friends of mine, children in early 20s, and they were very impressed with South Florida, as you can imagine, all the flash, all the beauty, <coughs> and that's the problem. Because in South Florida, not everything is what it appears. And so, you know, what do we tell people? Development is a local business because local knowledge, right? The person Jesse ran into at the airport knew who was who in this town. Jesse had flown in. A lot of times you just, hey, I'm going to go to Jacksonville. Not Jacksonville's Florida. Jacksonville's another country, you know? So local knowledge is very important. And number two, never assume anything, and never assume that people are as honest as you are. That's a great, great point. Um, it just, I don't care how long you've known these people, I don't care where they, what their family's all about. What did Reagan say about the Russians? Trust but verify, okay? You, you just, and, and you blame it on, on everything. I, I, I'm sorry, I know I've known you for 30 years, but this is just something I've got to do to get this deal done. And you can be nice about it. You don't have to say, I, I'm, I'm afraid you may be a liar and a cheater, and that's why I'm verifying all this. So it's a great point, local knowledge. Dustin, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, obviously, he was committing fraud, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and, and by the way, I, my, my limited experience with, or knowledge of title insurance, one of the few times the title insurance actually pays is in this fraud, you right. know, the inducement. Somebody pretending to have the capacity or the authority to sell and not having it. That's right. So what happened here, 75,000? Got it back. It was it was on deposit with an escrow agent. I lost my 50 due diligence. Uh, yeah. diligence. Guy had no money. Am I gonna spend half of my life for two years litigating, suing a guy? Right. Um, we told the state attorney about it and he was, you know, back then in the 80s in South Florida, he was like, get in line. <laughs> yes, sir. Would it make a difference if this guy had the property under contract and then was dealing with you on the end of maybe trying to wholesale the contract? Yeah, that's a great great question. We do that all the time. Well, somebody will come to us and still will say, I got this property under contract and I want to flip it to you. And that's fine. We'll buy the contract. The key is disclosure. What am I buying? Don't pretend, don't hide anything from me. Tell me what you're doing. I don't care. Look, I'm going to pay you $2 million for this site. If you've got it under contract for a million, good for you. I'm glad you're making a million dollars. I'm so willing to pay $2 million. A lot of people are, I'm afraid to tell Jesse because he's going to find out how much I'm making. In fact, the more money you make, the happier I am. Okay, because I want to go do more deals with you. I'd like to know how you got it under contract for half the price, but yeah, it's a great, very good question. Um, I work for a guy at Price Waterhouse, a partner, and he, t he used to talk about conflict of interest and disclosure. And his philosophy was 95% of conflicts can be resolved just by disclosure. Just tell them. Yeah. I'm a city official. Yeah, I met with this guy. I had dinner with him. He took uh, my wife and me to the Bahamas this weekend. Now, what's your question? Mm -hmm. It's the hiding stuff that, that, that gets you. Very good question. <coughs> some reason we decided to get in the RV campground business. <laughs> it sounded good at the time. <laughs> um, people own these RVs, they 
spend a million dollars on them. Uh, they go around the country and they stay in these campgrounds. And they're, I mean, we're talking high end. This is not some $20 a night type deal. Internet, pools, the whole deal. Uh, so we don't know anything about running campgrounds, but we're, we, we um, have a couple uh, uh, land holdings we've owned for a long time that we think might be pretty good sites. So what do we do? We've got to go find an operating partner, right? Somebody who knows how to spell campground. We certainly don't. So, again, using the network, let's, uh, we find out a friend of a friend of a friend. There's this guy in Rochester, New York, and he is a very, very successful apartment developer. He owns 15,000 apartment units. He's worth a couple hundred million dollars. He's the pillar of society in Rochester. He's just, he gives a lot of money. He's a real Horatio uh, Azure type of guy. He grew up very, very poor. His parents were Holocaust victims. Really just made something out of himself. Very honorable guy. And he owns a majority interest in this RV campground operating company. So we go meet with him, and he says, yeah, 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 I'll introduce you to my guys. I've heard about you guys um, through my network as well. I'd love to do a deal with him. We do a lot of due diligence on this guy. And everything we get, um, every, it's shining star, A plus. Just incredible work ethic, um, as I said, very successful big giver in the, in, in the area, guy we want to do business with. What we didn't do due diligence on was the guy running the operating company. This investor, he, he invested in a lot of different deals. He had just put up a lot of money to invest in this campground operating company, but he wasn't involved in the day to day. So we do this deal, we, we put up land worth $5 million, they invest a little bit of money, uh, they take it over, and away we go. A couple months go by, no reports. Nothing. Can't find out what's going on. Next thing we know, we had set aside a million dollars for parking, uh, for improvements at, at this park. We find out this guy's taken the million dollars and invested in other parks he owns that we don't own an interest in. All right. We go back to our financial partner, the guy in Rochester, he says, you know, I was just an investor in the company. I don't have any say so. I put money in. I really don't know what's going on there. Okay. Here's a couple blurbs from Google in the last 12 months about this operator. Wisconsin Attorney General J.B. Von Holland announced a temporary judgment against them. Um, campground was reassigned new management by New York State Supreme Court. The guy was a bad dude. All right? What was the mistake we made? Obvious, right? Okay, you know who you're dealing with. Who's the person that's really going to be running this thing? Don't do, do you want to do due diligence on his financial backer, but find out. If something bad happens, is that financial backer going to show up? He didn't get close to it. I said, sorry guys, it's not my deal. Felt no obligation. We weren't happy about that. Come and due diligence pitfalls, timely, um, getting timely information, sufficient due diligence, failing to adequately verify information and failing to act on red flags. All you had to do was Google this guy and know he's a bad character. Okay. How hard is it to Google? Never went there. Not, sounds pretty dumb now, doesn't it? Okay. We were relying on this, this, this network. Professor San Miguel talked about local knowledge. The other thing um, is both a strength and a pitfall is relying on your network. Your, your, your network's great at getting introductions to people, but nobody really knows what's really going on. Okay? You ever heard of a guy named Rothstein down here? Oh, yeah. That whole thing was built on word of mouth. Oh, you, you gotta talk to Rothstein. I'm making a fortune with him, or I'm up 30% this year. Okay, nobody was doing their due diligence, it was all word of mouth, and you can, it's really easy to rely on those people that you've known for a long time. So, wow, he said Rothstein's a good guy, he must be a good guy. And you, all those filters that you have when you're dealing with a stranger, they all go away, it's just human nature, right? So that's a, a lesson learned. 
just, just to pipe in on that, a couple of, uh, and those of you who've taken my accounting class, we've done a little bit of credit analysis and, you know, the five keys of credit, and the first one is character, right? And I, I've always said, my, my old boss, Mr. Godin, I always said there is never good business with bad people. Jerry Gaston, he used to run American Bankers when I worked there. It's like, you know, if you're playing with a snake and he bites you, you got nobody to blame but yourself. So it's very simple. What may seem obvious, you can't shortcut. It's simple enough to do a background check. I mean, you know, we complain about banks and all the you know, Bank Privacy Act requirements, but it's all about knowing who you're doing business with. You've got to know the character. That's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. Um, you know, Jesse was introduced to a guy, you know, Horatio Alger, everything checked out. But when push came to shove, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to backstop you guys. I brought you into this deal. I'm sorry, I'm substantial, I'm gonna make you whole because I'm an honorable guy. And that's what an honorable guy would do, right? That's right. You know, and, and maybe in today's day and age that's not that common, but I think that would be the right thing to do, you know, or at least step in and say, hey, let me fix this with you. Let's not just hey, mm -hmm. walk away. So but don't don't avoid even the smallest, you know what you know, as former auditors, I worked at TW as well. Uh, you got to look at everything with professional skepticism. So it's not, it's not that you have to doubt everyone, but you have to take a look at everything that's presented to you with that bit of saying, okay, I'll believe you, but let me verify it anyway. Skepticism is a great word. One of my colleagues has a plaque up in his office that says, I'd like to do good deals with good people. But if given the choice, I'd rather do a bad deal with a good person than a good deal with a bad person. Yeah. In the long run. Skepticism, wonderful word. Another RV campground business. Now you know why I roll my eyes to somebody who says RV campgrounds. Different deal. Okay? We own 500 acres in uh, uh, western Virginia, about an hour west, hour and a half west of Dulles Airport. It's up in the hills, beginning of the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains, beautiful. And um, they, they had uh, used it as a trailer park. Now that's different from a RV campground and a trailer park is where you live in a mobile home year round. But no, nevertheless, the infrastructure was there and we said, with this great operating partner we had, let's, uh, let's uh, convert it to an RV campground. We had a former county administrator on our staff. And at the time, we said, you know, county administrators, a lot of the due diligence that you do is all about entitlements, meeting with the local people. Am I going to be able to get my approvals? And they talk a language that a lot of us don't. Okay, And it's just like, oh, yeah, I've known this guy for 20 years. He was the county administrator when I was the county administrator. So we send him up, Anthony. We send them up, and it's just they have a great time. They worked on some boards together, county governor, uh, uh, administrator boards. They went out and played golf for a couple of days, and he came back and he said, "No problem. We're going to build. Uh, we're going to expand it, convert it to an RV campground. We're going to have 300 units. They they love me. I love them. No problem. All right. So we close." And uh, we had actually bought some adjacent land as well. We closed. Our, guy, our development guys go in and they apply for permits to expand it to 300 uh, additional campsites. And the county guy says, the planning director says, you're not zoned for this. What do you mean? Our, Anthony went out and played golf and had dinner and you know they said no problem. So we get with Anthony and said, Anthony, what the hell? He goes, yeah, they, they said I could build it. So what did you specifically ask them? Well, it turned out he had asked them, if we build it, this, didn't talk about rezoning, just said if we build it, will we need to do anything with roads or utilities? But he never said, can we build it? Or what's involved in getting approvals to build it? Okay? And we went and asked the county commissioner up there, or administrator, he said, Anthony never asked me that. We never even talked about it. I didn't even know what it was rezoned. It's been sitting there for 100 years, untouched. 
24 months to get it rezoned, and we only got approval for 150 units. And we have to, had to build a packaged sewer plant at the cost of $125,000. We sent the wrong guy. Again, he fell into that trap of it's all about relationships, didn't want to ask the hard questions because they were buddies, relied on them, got nothing in writing. We sent the wrong guy, we asked the wrong questions, so we didn't get anything in writing. Okay? Skepticism. Great, great word, okay? Now, you, there's an art to this, guys. You, 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 you don't want to come in and have somebody say, man, they were a jerk, okay? And you say, look, I'm here to do a job. Nobody's going to mind if you ask the questions, if you ask them the right way, okay? Another dumb mistake. Get it in writing, ask the right questions and the right people. Question? What happened with this property? Uh, <laughs> The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey said. We uh, built the 150 campsites. Um, between us and our operating partner, we lost $2 million. And as part of a global settlement for all these other issues that we were having, the partner ended up taking it over and we lost our entire investment. Park's probably losing five dollars to $800,000 a year right now. Because you, you, you only built half of what you're going to build. Didn't work out. So. Yes, well, uh, one of the things that we, we spoke about with the guest speaker that we had last week was he said he works, in, he's, a, he's an acquisitions guy at a small fund, which I invested. He's an ex HFF guy and a good friend, and, but it's a small shop. And so they outsource a lot of their work. And his comment to you all, if you remember, was I know what I know and I know what I don't know, and I rely on professionals. And we got into the discussion of, you know, what's more cost effective or what's more pragmatic. There's no pride in villages. If you're going to a place or into an area that you don't know or don't know about, don't hesitate to rely on the people and spend the money. You know, we said, you know, there's, there's a cost component to doing diligence, which is a sunk cost. And you have to assume it's a sunk cost. A lot of times companies get bigger, they start developing acquisitions teams. But that doesn't necessarily obviate the need to have professionals get involved, especially in zoning, title, or other legal related issues, right? You know, at, um, at Kadena, we had guys that were ex assistant county managers. They knew everybody. They played golf with everybody. They, they dressed much better than I. They slicked hair. And you don't know how many times we get into problems because they represented to us. You can do this. Well, they never asked, but what do I have to do in order to do it? So what's the process? <clears throat> oh, they said we could rezone it, but then you've got to a local planning council that and then it's the 36 months or the 48 months and the three million dollars of cost to get there. And now all of a sudden, real estate can have a great yield or a pretty crappy yield depending on what? The income stream, right, <laughs> or the cost that you've got into it. It's not, it's not rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. You know, NOI over cost. So it can yield 20% or 2% or negative 8%. And there's only two variables you can play with. But what does it generate? And what did you pay for it? And time is money. Time is money. So, and then the other one I wanted before I forget on the previous one, uh, Jesse talked about the doing the diligence on the CEO. We gotta realize what we're doing diligence on or who we should be doing. Sometimes in real estate, we're looking at assets. We're looking at a vacant piece of land. But sometimes we're getting involved in a joint venture or we're getting involved in an operating business, an RV park, a self-storage facility, a foreign trade zone, um, a, a hospitality business. So now the diligence isn't only asset level, it's operating business level which involves management now. So, and it's not just background checks, it's competency. Is this the right partner? Do they really have the network? Do they really have the relationships? Do they have the proven track record? So. We, um, we tend to um, look at our, uh, where we have partners involved in the three categories. One is where we're doing a deal where an investor's putting money up front and they're never gonna put another dime in. 
that's pretty easy. You know, verify what the source of funds is, but you're not going to close without the money. You close, they put the money out. You write them a letter every quarter and say, we're doing great, love Jesse, and that's the end of it. Second is, what happens when you're doing a deal where they're putting out money now, but also are putting out money in the future? Maybe it's to fund deficits or whatever. Now you got to really look at the due, financial due diligence. How do I know you're going to have money in 12 months to write checks? And as Professor San Miguel said, the key for, for, for um, uh, due diligence is when you're not getting their money, it's when you're buying their brain power, the operating partner. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you into this because of what you know and what you can do, not necessarily because you're writing a check. Now, what happens if the guy, let's say he's very, very honorable and he dies? Who takes his place? He gets hit by a bus, has a stroke. What do you do? What if he just leaves and gets another job? How deep is the organization? Are we, are, is this organization led by one person or is there a whole team there? And, and so that's where you really get past the financial due diligence and end up underwriting. Who, who am I doing business with? Who am I getting married to? Okay. Good point. Questions? <laughs> we buy a staple store out in Iowa or something. Close on it, do all due diligence, engineers, phase one, buy it all. Cool. Um, we buy the store, record rains, floods the, you know, time to get out the, the, the ark. It's, it's, it's just uh, water all over the place. We get a call from Staples one day and they said, we're flooded. I'm like, okay, well that's, you got flood insurance. He said, no, it's the water is, is not up to the, the doorstop. In fact, the parking lot is dry. It's coming up through the floor. Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's concrete. Water can't come up through concrete. Well, long story short, turns out the guy that developed the staple store um, didn't put down a, uh, a water vapor barrier. Stuff. I don't know if you, anybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. You roll this piece out and you lay the concrete on top. And concrete, unbeknownst to me, is porous and water does come up, seep through. Water is an amazing uh, in, in, invention. It, <coughs> excuse me. It'll go. It'll find anywhere it wants to go. Didn't do the vapor beer. Um, now what do you do? The tenant's calling up saying, this is a construction problem. I didn't buy insurance for that. Okay? And you guys leased me something, a building, and you told me everything was fine. And you didn't build it right. Now what's our response? We didn't build it. We didn't build it. <laughs> build it. And so, I don't care if you did it or not. You're the owner. I, my lease is with you. So what do we do? Hire our engineers, find out the water, uh, the, the vapor barrier wasn't put down. It's going to cost, I looked up the number, $225,000 to repair it. Now what do we do? Go after the Got to repair it, first of all, right? Like 24 7? Yeah. Or Staples is going to uh, terminate the lease. Okay, and then what's, what's, a, what's a, build, a flooded building or a building with puddles vacated by Staples worth? A lot less than what we paid for it, right? Okay? So we got crews there night and day trying to correct the problem. Staples was great. They kept the store open. It wasn't a flood. From time to time, these puddles would appear. And we had uh, extra, we, you know, we hired two full-time people to be there at the store at all time to mop it up and put up the cones that say danger of water, that type of thing. So we get a repair. It costs $225,000. Staples is just incredibly nice about it. We abated rent for three months. I think we would have given a year if they demanded it. Now what do we do? Go after the seller. We go after the seller, right? Okay. Well, he says, I, I sold this to you as is. Anybody know what an as is contract is? I'm selling this to you as is. He made a representation, and it was a very general representation, that said, I'm not aware of anything 
that would affect the majority, um, the lease or the longevity of the building. <coughs> that wasn't the right word, but something like that. It was a very general representation. By the way, one of the, the we would have done it differently. One of the problems we have, we bought we bought somebody else's contract to buy this, so we were bound by their purchase contract and we couldn't change it. Um, so we sued the seller well, and talking to the engineer and the engineer said, I told this guy when he built it that he's going to have a problem. He knew about it, the developer did, the guy that sold, sold the building. So we went after him. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you'll find when you get involved in commercial litigation, it's, it's as much about publicity as it is about getting in, in a court. You really want to go after their reputation and just put as much as you can in the paper. And we played that game. Um, he agreed to fund the repairs, but we had to eat the litigation costs, which were pretty significant. Okay. So what happened? We got excited about buying the Staples at an eight and a half percent cap rate when it was worth six percent. We kind of we we were buying somebody else's purchase contract, but it was like we're going to make so much money. That's okay. We can live with that contract. And here we found the the, the problem with the guy. When you do your purchase contracts. Uh, and I yelled at the attorneys all day long. I was in Baltimore earlier this week with our attorneys screaming about purchase agreement. It was 87 pages long. And some of it is, is, is nuts and doesn't belong in there, but there's reasons why there's so much in a purchase contract. It's do you want one, one warranty, one rep from a seller saying, I think everything's okay, or are you gonna have five pages of very specific? Okay, one of the questions we always ask in our representations we put in our purchase contracts is, they have to um, affirm that it was built according to code, if they were the builder. That, that right there, he, he sort of committed fraud. This guy was in a hurry to sell everything. But um, lesson learned. Yes? I have a quick question. How do you go about repairing that problem, though? Yeah, I, I, can't think of, I can't think of a way to go about repairing that came in and they put a felt barrier on top of the existing concrete. And then screened it? And they put in an additional, I may have the, the number wrong, I believe they poured an additional one and a half to two inches of co new concrete on top of the new vapor barrier. So that, that slab's like this now, mm -hmm. okay? So that's what they did. They blocked off parts of the store, they did this at nights. And um, this was in a county, uh, had, a county that had blue laws, they were closed on Sundays. So they did a lot of work on, on Sundays. Where, where was this? Iowa. I were in the Nebraska. Nebraska. That would be part of the inspection to see that that, that barrier is down before you pull it. Yeah, you can't, that's a, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, do not rely on the local right, inspectors. Sure. Oftentimes they'll, if they know that the builder well, they'll allow things to go by and expect that he'll do it. They have, uh, they're busy. Sometimes this helps. <laughs> okay. Just stuff. Uh, I'm not disparaging any of these inspectors. People make mistakes. Don't rely on, but use your professional engineers. Point, not your staff. Yes. Well, Jesse, one of the, maybe you can share your, your experience. One of you know, the experiences that I've had is, especially when you get into institutional um, sellers, uh, the biggest obstacle we have in getting a contract negotiated is, is actually warranties and what they're willing to represent versus what you want them to represent. In fact, I think, you know, a lot of times in these institutional sales, with your offer, you need to submit your markup to the purchase sale agreement that they're willing to sign. And so they'll not only look at the dollars you're willing to offer, but what you're looking to them, you know, for. Um, and it really becomes the push-pull, and there is the importance of diligence, because a lot of times, you really want the asset. You get enamored with the asset, but the seller's not gonna backstop you. And so you really need to then rely on yourself, your team, and your consultants to get over the hump because you're not going to have that safety net. You're not going to have somebody to go back to. Now, I don't know what you're Absol doing. Absolutely. The, um, the um, saying that we have is warrant warranties aren't worth the paper they're written on. Okay. 
institutional investors won't sign them, number one. Individuals will, especially if they're making a lot of money, but they hide all their assets and put them in trusts and everything. You can't. It's very, very difficult to go after an individual in a, uh, a commercial litigation suit. And it's very, very expensive to do it as well. So, absolutely right. The institutional guys are like, I know nothing. I don't know what happened. I, I wore a pinstripe suit in New York every day. I went to the project once a year and I didn't know what I was looking at. I'm not making any reps or warranties. Okay? You do all your own due, due diligence. I'll give you access to everything, but at the end of the day, it's as is. Yeah. The, and the institutional guys, boy, they won't sign anything, right? <laughs> I had a question. No, it but if you were to do this all over again, you still would have been in the same situation. Um, if I were willing to... Because, I mean, you still had to sue the guy, even if he did... By doing it all over again, I, I, I tell you what we've changed as a result of this, is if we're buying an existing contract and it doesn't meet our standards, we either we demand an amendment <coughs> or we won't, we won't do it. But I think at the end of the day, you'd still have to take this guy to court. No. Um, if we've done our purchase agreement, you, probably, you may be right. Yeah, there's certain things, at, at the end of the day, right. uh, diligence is about mitigating risk. It's not about totally eliminating it. In a case like this, unless the seller was willing to warn, you know, or represent that he developed this in accordance to code, and even then set some money aside, that's one of the things that you can try to do in a contract is hold back part of the purchase price. But again, most sellers aren't willing to, you know, live with that, uh, or they're going to limit their exposure under warranties. Um, but then it goes back to knowing who you're doing business with, Dustin. You know, I mean, there's nothing foolproof in life. You know, life is a contact sport. You know, sometimes. You right. Get I mean, even in an inspection, inspection, they're not going to check to see if there's a water barrier in the. Yeah, the, like a normal. Yeah, maybe line item. a very good one here. In a, in a, looking back, 2020, if I could do everything different, I'd go back and I'd look. I'd talk to the general contractor. I'd talk to the concrete. Um, so you're not going to do that. You don't have enough time to do that. And the, the, it's a great word. You're trying to mitigate risk. Not it, it, if, if your job is to identify every single risk, you're never going to finish your due diligence. So I, I, yeah, I think you're probably right. We probably end up in the same situation. The key is understand people lie, steal, and cheat to make money. Okay. Careful. We're back to. The, do you know who you're dealing with here? And, and, and the point, and, and this doesn't seem that exaggerated, but a Staples, which is a relatively credit you know, name out there, if these triple net deals today are trading anywhere from the high fives to the high sixes, depending on who, who they are, if you're getting an eight and a half, if the deal's too good, if Rothstein's giving you 28%, <laughs> if Madoff is giving you 30%, and everybody else makes five, if, you know, it smells like a duck and it quacks like a duck, right? It's a duck. It's a duck. Very good. So is it, was there any way in the due diligence process that you would have been able to see, figure this out before you oh, got yeah, it? Yeah, if you talk to the GC and the subs, but... But you think the GC's going to tell you that? Yeah, he forgot to put it. <laughs> what about? You might not even know. No, uh, we found out the GC was instructed not to put it down as a cost savings measure. Oh, wow. It's a minor expense. But is that cold? Somebody talked that shouldn't have. Yeah. Sir? Is that cold? Like, should that have been done? Well, that's not was in Iowa, yeah. you're saying. So in Iowa, that's not part yeah, of the code? I don't know. In Florida, yeah. No, but here's my question, though. When you get when you get all the construction documents and all the drawings on a property, one of the things that we had to do, like for for example, an industrial project that we worked on, one of the things that we had to do was we had to photograph every step of the process, and that had to be a part of the package that we handed over to the owners when we were finished with the project. Is that not something that you would get as a part of your diligence package from them? Yeah. I'm in Iowa with the, with the local Yoko. Okay. <laughs> One of the, as we proceeded with the lawsuit, which as I said got settled, was your, your question exactly, was, was um, not putting the vapor barrier in code. 
And the answer was it was gray. It was not black and white. In Florida, you, you got to do it, you're going to go to jail, right? Very, very different out there. But even if that shows it on the plans, it doesn't mean it's put down. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's right. A part of the plans was that we actually had to, we actually had to include in the packet actual photographs of different things being put in mm -hmm. for wow. that purpose. I had a lot of pictures. <laughs> I did. I had to take a lot of pictures. It was for Nestle in Jamaica. And we had to do a lot of, because they had to send it all overseas, so we had to do a lot of photographs of everything that went on. Don't worry, she likes taking pictures. It was fun. <laughs> that's, that's remarkable. You have a diligent, did, diligent owner there. Wow. We and here when, like, when you have like Lennar build a development, residential, you know, the inspector will check one house out of ten houses. And if the first house is okay, then the assumption is the other ten are okay. And they, they have a bunch of problems with it. You know, the, the, the thing really? here, Dustin, to your question of not finding this, I think Jesse's company had the opportunity to go back and actually recover some of the costs because they were dealing with the original building. Imagine that this defect had not shown until there had been a subsequent transfer of ownership. Right. And there wasn't even knowledge at that point. You know, you're right. I mean, there's certain things that you just can't protect yourself against. That's why you try to eliminate the ones that you can. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, this is a good one. You guys convinced I'm a total idiot now? I <laughs> this is like five of my 999 lists of dumb things we've done. This wasn't mine. A very large public home building company based in Philadelphia. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's only one. <coughs> Tall. 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 Okay. Tall at the time was in the business of developing golf course developments, right? houses, and big, big ones, and high end. Well-known, well-regarded golf courses. These were you know, four to eight hundred thousand dollar homes, which back in the eighties was a lot of money now. But back in the eighties was a lot of. They'd always wanted to do something close in in Philadelphia because that's their home. They're doing a lot of stuff in Florida and Texas and California. They happened upon this site just outside of Philadelphia, and um, it's perfect. Great location. Um, access to commuter lines, transportation, and all the, the roads, the utilities. It was just like, wow, this, this is wonderful. Give the acquisition guys a, a bonus. Doing your due diligence. Soils report are great. Phase one is perfect. Everything's just check, 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 check. You do the title search, and they find this thing. There's a recording in the title records that says, there was a filing 60 years ago. No attachment. Okay, and everything's online, scanned. There's no paper files anymore. All it says is there was a filing in the name of such and such a, a corporation. They go to the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania. Corporations defunct hasn't been around for 20 years. Okay, can't find anybody. What do you do? Don't know, really don't know what it is. 60 years ago, corporation went out of business 20 years ago. What do you do? Really wanted to do something in their backyard. Okay? And they're gonna make a lot of money. So they bought the land. And um, you go through all their planning, their approvals, and now it's time to start publicizing this thing as you do before you actually start selling homes. And Toll announces acquisition of a property. They're going to build 350 unit real estate development with a Tom Fazio design golf course. A guy knocks on Toll Brothers' uh, office and says, Could I speak to Bob Toll? It's about what? It's about the land that he bought. Well, why, would, why do you need to talk to him? He really needs, he's going to want to talk to me, trust me. <laughs> Toll's got a, Bob's got a, a, a really nice open door policy and he got in there. Mr. Toll, I've been a big fan of yours. Um, 
I actually had some affiliation with this property. Really, what was that? Well, my grandfather was a minister. And there was a real wealthy guy that owned this land and thousands of other acres. And he found Christ and God through my grandfather, the minister. And to reward him for saving his soul, he gave him this 500 acres, however many acres it was. With the caveat, my grandfather was a teetotaler. He hated alcohol, thought it was the cause of all the world's problems. And they put a deed restriction on the property that said no alcohol. And I see you're going to build a golf course. Uh, so I, I don't know anything about golf, but I understand you serve drinks and beer. And um, I was just kind of wondering what you're going to do. Paul's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Calls his lawyer in. Of course, the lawyer's blood just drains from his face. It's like, oh, crap. That was that thing that was in the title records that we couldn't find. Well, do you have any evidence? Boom. <laughs> Here it is. All right, long story short, Paul says, would you be, for a price, would you be willing to release the deed restriction? And the guy said, look, I drank. Yeah, it, it, it didn't come down to the DNA, but I really revere, respect my grandfather. My father was a minister as well. And I really feel that this should be, I, I would be just serving my, my, my um, predecessors if I released it. And I appreciate your offer, but uh, I'm not going to sell my soul for, for this. It was important to my grandfather. All right. So Toll, being a very, very smart guy, he says, oh crap. Uh, serving alcohol, by the way, at a golf club is really, really important, okay? It's a money generator. Um, you can't have, imagine, you can't host a wedding, and you, I mean, you just can't have a party, a corporate outing, much less your members want to come in and have a cold beer after a round of golf, right? So Toll, being a very smart guy, says, is there any land we can buy immediately adjacent to this and redo our plans. And we'll serve alcohol out of that parcel. That's where we'll put the clubhouse. The only one they can buy, it's a perfect parcel. It's, it's immediately adjacent. It's only separated by a small screen. Okay? They put it under contract and they said, this is easy. We'll put the clubhouse on this small parcel. We'll build a bridge across the stream What's a bridge cost? Nothing, right? And that's where the carts will be able to get to the golf course, blah, 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 blah. EPA comes in. Army Corps of Engineers comes in. The City of Philadelphia Regional Planning Council comes in. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania comes in. And when they're done, they're, they build a $750,000 bridge across a creek, not as wide as this room. $300,000 to buy the parcel, $750,000 to build the bridge. Okay, they got it done. What could they have done differently? Research that, uh, that, that title claim. Yeah. Find out just how much a soul cost. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was internal. <laughs> I think they're pretty well satisfied. They did all the due diligence they could. What kind of bridge could they have built for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars? Oh, it's unbelievable. It's got I I I was there and played golf on the side. Sorry? Taps. Taps, yeah. <laughs> Taps on the clubhouse side. It's it's exquisite. It's unbelievable. Uh, much much more than you needed for the stream. Guys, it's it's really important. I, I I've not personally been involved with the transaction where the restrictions have impacted us. But in the community where I live, I live in Key Biscayne, uh, the island was owned by a guy named Dr. Matheson, who had a coconut plantation. And, you know, he was a very magnanimous guy, or so everyone thought, because he donated half of the key to the county in the 1940s so the county could have a park. And it was all really nice, and, you know, so, so the deed that was, you know, the deed, you know, conveyed the property. And it was a small little board. <coughs> You know, this board would determine what uses could be applied there, but they were parks, you know, it was all parkland, right? And so, you know, over the years, a marina was built, and a golf course was built, and it was a zoo, 
and the tennis center was built, and everything was happy, right? Until the grandson, who was an attorney of this, you know, Dr. Matheson, had a totally different interpretation of what this, you know, these deep de de restrictions and what parkland, you know, actually comprised. And so we've been going through a process over the last 15 years where all these uses that are active um, are no longer really viewed by the courts as permitted under the restrictions. And so, you know, they want to build a, a major structure to accommodate the tennis center or the tennis facility for the, you know, the Sony tournament that's there every year. They can't do it. The golf course had to reduce some of their activities. The softball courts, the lights, the soccer field, the Crandon Park have to go away because those are active uses. And it's all about passive uh, you know, uses. And so you know, 60 years later, people forget that he gave the land in exchange for building a causeway. It wasn't for free. So he could sell the subsequent land to the Mackles to build houses. But now somebody, you know, 60 years later, somebody has a different interpretation and it has a huge impact on the community. I'm not taking sides, I'm just saying, beware, these restrictions have an afterlife. And judges, even though they make no sense, and the guy's trying to govern from the grave, he died 30 years ago, judges are very, very reluctant to overturn deed restrictions, regardless of whether they make sense or not. Are you all familiar, familiar with Arvida? Yeah. Okay, who's not? Okay, how do I explain our life? Large home builder, you know, a lot of people made a lot of money. Disney bought it at one point, but they were a large builder of multi plan communities here in South Florida. Weston, for example, was an Arvida development. They dominated South Florida for the home, the golf course home building, especially, and communities. And, uh, and Arvida stood for? Arthur Viney Davis. Arthur Viney Davis. Davis, yes. Who was from Alcoa, right? CEO of Alcoa. Oh, was he really? He was the CEO of Alcoa. Okay. Um, everybody, it was a great company. Everybody wanted to work there, and it was remarkable what they did. And they were, they were in the 20th century when the rest of the home building business was in the 19th century. Very innovative. And Weston, um, um, just a, a number of large chunks of Boca. Yeah, a lot of Boca. Gables Estates was the original. I don't know if you knew that. Really? Yeah. Right. And you have Davis Road right there, by the way. Yeah. So, <coughs> so this company is not owned by St. Joe's, right? At one point, it's owned by St. Joe's, and then some of the management took it, and then they sold it to Chuck Cobb was involved in this management yeah. buyout, and then they sold it to Disney after that. Disney afterwards, okay. So I got Peter Carver. Rommel somehow was involved with that group too. Really? So Arvida still, this company still exists, whatever, however it's been pieced and everything. And it generates anywhere from 10 to $20 million a year in revenues. From what? They don't own anything. They own deed restrictions and easements on every project they ever did. These guys were smart. He said, I'm gonna go build a development, a big, big development in whatever city, Coral Springs or Western or whatever. I'm gonna spend a lot of money on infrastructure, right? Roads, utilities, stormwater drainage, the whole deal. I'm not gonna let some guy buy an adjacent parcel and tap into all that. So I'm gonna put up a buffer strip 10 foot wide around every single one of my developments. And if they wanna tap into it, they gotta come knock on my door and buy access. 10 to 20 million dollars a year in revenues they're getting from these access agreements. Smart. They didn't just do it as a buffer. I mean, if you if you uh, buy two houses and want to tear them down and uh, build one big mansion on on the two, you got to pay them a fee. It's amazing. Uh, they were very innovative in this, especially in the late 70s and early 80s when. Uh, could get by with a, uh, a lot of things you couldn't legally do now in, in Florida. Okay, so these are really, really, really important. And as I said, they may not make sense. And you might say, look, I just bought a lot next door. And all I want to do is tap into the sewer line. Sorry, you can't. Give me $10,000, I'll let you. Okay, 
That means you got to have a private sewer, not public, and all the rest of that. So there's a, there's some money to be made in there. They were innovative. So that's the Toll Brothers story. If you ever see Bob Toll, do not ask him about this. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a group of um, guys from Central America, uh, fifth generation coffee growers. And it really is coffee. They sell Starbucks 4% of their coffee beans every single year. Big. Um, these all Ivy League educated, um, they're actually in the Honduras, but Ivy League educated, smart, smart people, very smart. They have an interesting investment strategy. Growing up in Honduras, they're used to small towns. And their strategy is, you know, why in the world is everybody paying a 5% cap rate for a Staples? That's crazy. We're going to go in places where the institutional investors don't want to go. They love small towns. A small town with 20,000 people, 40,000 people. They generally go in, there's one main shopping center at the, at the intersection of Main and Main downtown. It's dilapidated, it's got a pizza parlor, a tattoo parlor, a hair place. They'll buy these centers for $25 a square foot. They'll put maybe $10 a foot in improvements, 20. And there are tenants that love small towns as well. There's a company called Bedcock Furniture. Anybody ever heard of them? Yeah. I never had. They will not go in a large city. They don't like them. They don't know how to do it. They want to be the only furniture store within about a 40 mile radius. And they have a following of about uh, 15, 20 tenants that will follow them when they renew these centers. Anyway, that, whether you agree with it or not, that's their investment strategy, okay? So they go in this town in Arkansas, and they said, this town is taken off because there's some things happening in an industry. We think it's going to grow. But everybody's shopping at this mom pa grocery store that's a little bit bigger than a 7-Eleven, but not much. They don't carry multiple brands. We're gonna, one of the people that follow, follow the, follows them is a national grocery store chain. We're gonna bring them in and we're gonna be the best thing that ever happened to this town. People are gonna get a new grocery store, right? Who could be happier? Well, long story short, they built it. Um, they actually took an existing center, converted it. Tenant comes in, tenant calls up after a couple months and says, Nobody's shopping at our store. What do you mean nobody's stopping at it? Shopping at it? It's all new and the population's growing. Where are they shopping? At Mom and Pa, uh, Uncle Fred's store down the street. Turn out Uncle Fred, the former mayor, built a school named after him, yada, 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 Chair, uh, chairman of the church you know, advisory committee. Everybody loves old Uncle Fred and Aunt Wilma. They're not changing. Why? You want me to go shop in this national store? I never, they're out of state. I don't even know. I heard they're, they're, uh, they're owned by uh, Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so the tenant comes in and says, there's a provision on the lease that if they don't reach a certain sales level within three years, they can go, not only go dark, they can terminate. Yeah. But, all right, so they're saying, guys, we're not gonna wait three years, we're gonna go dark now, and in three years we're gonna stop paying our lease unless you do something. So, what's the first thing we do? We went to see Uncle Fred. <laughs> said, Uncle Fred, how would you like to have a bigger store? Uncle Fred said, and we were all over him, like, this is an amazing story. Harvard ought to write a case story about how you treat your customers. We're, we're just so impressed with how you do things. How would you like to have a bigger store? He says, why would I want to do that? He says, I have to buy more inventory, the light bills more. I'm kind of happy with what, what, what I'm doing right now. Okay. So we went back to the grocery store and we cut the rent by and looked it up. What was it? Let's see, did I say? 60%. Reduced by 60%. Lesson learned. You gotta know your customer. 
And I find that one of the things I talk about to other groups is you have in, in this in corporate strategy, one of the things they talked about are you product centric or are you customer centric? Which is just a fancy way of saying, what do you focus more on what you build or what you sell, or are you focus more on your customer? And most people are product centric, especially our industry. Okay, if you go to Terry Stiles and say, what do you do for a living, what would he tell you? I manage properties. Yeah. What kind of properties? Office. I'm an office Excel. building developer, right? I'm, an, I'm a commercial broker. What's he telling you? He didn't tell you anything about his customer, did he? He's talking about the product. We all do that. Somebody says to me, what do you guys do? We invest in apartments. Okay. I was in California recently and met with a group that are building a store in LA. The store, I say, what, what's your store going to do? And he said, we're going to cater to women between the age of 18 and 28. What do you, cater to, to do what? Anything they want to buy, we're going to sell at our store. And we're going to specialize on knowing everything there is to know about women between the age of 18 and 28. We're going to look at their insurance buying needs, their retirement needs, tires, uh, car service, brand new cars, renting. We're going to be the store for these people. That's probably taking it to an extreme, but that's an example of a customer-centric organization. Okay? It's a lot easier to say, I'm really, really good at building widgets. And I'm gonna master that. And you just make this, it's field of dreams. If you build it, they will come, right? Um, I'm always amazed at the number of people that I'll meet developers and they'll say, you're building a new apartment building in Boca. Yeah. Tell me about it. Oh, I got showers and fixtures and I got all this and I got built-ins and flat screen TVs. And like, who, who are your tenants going to be? Well, people that live in Boca. Well, okay, <laughs> duh. Okay. What, what's the demog demographic profile? Um, and what's the mix? Are these retirees, early retirees, empty nesters, millennials? Yes. Okay. Well, who are you going to who are you going to market to? Yes. <laughs> All. Okay. It, and uh, you talk to these advertising companies in South Florida. Um, it, no, social media is going to correct a lot of this because that gives you the ability to really drive right into very specific markets. You buy advertising in the Sun Sentinel or the Miami Herald, everybody reads it, right? Okay. Our industry is not very, or most industries are not, our industry is really, really not good at being customer centric. Okay. Um, what we get in, when we buy an existing apartment complex, we get into the records. And um, through various uh, 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 means, we can find out just about everything there is to know about these people. Their income, their age, uh, where they work, a lot of different things. We get this profile, okay? And we do, the, they're called psychographic groups, which is a, another fancy term of just saying, I have 500 people living in this apartment complex or 1,000. What do I know about them? And you kind of divide them into groups. Well, there's one group that are millennials that are making between twenty and forty thousand dollars a year that are employed in the service business. And you do all of these groups, and then you begin to focus on what can I do to to to, to attract more of those people. Okay. Let me. Uh, I didn't put this in my presentation. I go to a presentation a couple months ago. Uh, it's an apartment conference in Boca Raton. There's 2,500 people in the audience. It's the apartment uh, uh, meeting of the year. They announced that the senior VP uh, from Google, who's in charge of the real estate applications, is going to speak. It's, I'll be good. So we get back from lunch, and this you know, young guy with this badge gets up, and he's addressing the, the microphone. And I figure he's somebody who 